London is in the midst of a serious housing crisis. We've been building about 25,000 homes a year. And in order to keep up with the growth in the population, we need to be building 50 or even 60,000. It's really important that we think not only about the quality of the housing itself, but about the quality of the spaces and the quality of the neighborhoods that we're creating. We wanted to look at what makes urban areas good, what makes them function right. And this goes all the way back to um, the 19th century. There's writings about how pedestrian access is important and how wide pavements should be. For example, if you look at Jane Jacobs' work in New York in the 1960s, it's about how wide the pavement should be so girls can skip rope on their way to school and things like that. We focused in this report on the concept of villages. Villages are the kind of prototypical, aspirational place for English people to live. But also, London is quintessentially a city of villages. A lot of the new big scale developments that are going up in London call themselves villages. So we asked ourselves, well, what makes a village, a London village? Can we boil that down to a set of specific characteristics and then look at some of these new villages and ask, do they make the grade or is it just a, a marketing tool? The six characteristics are that a village is small and intimate. Second, that it's locally driven and locally responsive. That the people there feel a sense of ownership. Third, that a village has a unique identity. You know what kind of a place that is, what kind of people live there, what the architecture is like. Fourth, it has to be designed for social interaction. So you want a public realm that is walkable, that's permeable to pedestrians, that has places where people naturally congregate and meet. Fifth, a village has to be functional. At a minimum, you need some kind of health care, probably a pub, church, or a religious institution. Then the final characteristic is that there's a mixed community. Lots of places that call themselves retirement villages. And we're saying, actually, that's not a village. A real village has a range of ages. But not only a range of ages, that you have a range of incomes. So you need to have some affordable housing, some social housing in there with market housing, a range of employment and types of residents. Well, the case study we looked at was Kidbrook Village, which is in the Royal Borough of Greenwich. And this is a development by Barclay Homes on the site of the Farrier Estate. The Farrier Estate was built in the early 60s to the kind of highest standards of the time. It was modernist, concrete. It was very popular when it was first built because it represented a big improvement on the living standards of most of the people who moved in there. But by the 90s, it was kind of a local byword for crime, antisocial behavior, you know, burnt out cars, drug dealing, and so on. The full redevelopment will have more than 4,000 homes, and there's about 1,500 there at the moment. So we looked at how it's functioning now with regard to these six criteria. One of the things that we thought was done well at Kidbrook is the thought given to integrating this new village with the surrounding areas. The development, rather than starting at the center and building out, because the site is, is so big, if you started in the middle and built out, you wouldn't reach the edges for 15 years or something, and you just kind of have an island marooned in a circle of building site. So they started at the edges and are building towards the center, and that means that the edges, which are next to existing neighborhoods, already started to integrate and, and form networks and so on with the existing neighborhoods and really feel like they are part of the London fabric, and, and that's good. The flip side of that is that the central bit, which is going to be what they call the village hub, at the moment is just some kind of prefabs. It does have a shop, it is right next to the station, and it has a doctor's surgery and so on, but it has a very kind of temporary feel. It hasn't yet generated the critical mass of leisure activities and socializing and so on that they hope for. The design of the overall development 
was also really thoughtfully done. Um, the master planners put a priority on pedestrian access to all the areas. So it's, it's very green. Only 35% of the land area is going to be covered with dwellings when it's finished. So 65% will be green. And you can get to anywhere in the development without going on a road. Our first recommendation was that developers and, and local authorities, when they're dealing with these big sites, they should have a clear idea from the very outset what kind of a community they want to create. The second recommendation is that on these major developments that might take many years or even decades to build out, developers should, rather than seeing their job as finished when the keys are handed over, they should plan on working with the people who move in to help them shape the kind of places that they want to live. That means developers have to expect to put in some serious time and resources into community development because they and the people who move in have a joint interest in making these places successful. Third, there's some rather technical regulations about how local authorities go out to tender for big projects. We argue that the criteria should not be limited to cost alone, that for these big developments that are going to affect the lives of residents and neighbors and Londoners for, for so many years, the quality of the place has to have an important role.